to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Okay, everybody get up now. We have two people sitting over here on the right side. Oh, okay. <laughs> Did you notice how Burl said yes, dear, and she walks three paces behind him? <clears throat> Mickey, Mickey has her well trained. <laughs> All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 24. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete, without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I always love that 27th verse, don't you? I adjure you. If you don't do it, I'm going to get you good. Now, I'm, we're going to have a reality check here. Uh, if you think this is true, if you agree with this, uh, raise your hand, yes. The Christian life is a very easy life to live. If you believe that, raise your hand. Good. I think everybody here tonight is saved. This is good. If you want an easy life, you need to find another one besides the Christian life. If you want a life that's well worth it now and forever, then the Christian life is the one. And notice as <clears throat> we come to the close here, we are given some commands. Paul commands the church, and his commands to the church indicate that the, what the nature of the believer's commitment to the Lord is and should be. And at the same time, Paul's prayer also indicates the nature of God's commitment to his people. And that's the thing that really makes it work, isn't it? Think back to say, for example, I think it's about Genesis chapter 15 where the Lord promises the land to Abraham. And as the day passes on and night is coming, uh, all of a sudden the uh, animals are slain. And this was a good way of making a contract back in those days. They kill the animal, cut them in half, put one half over on this side, one half on the other. And the two people who struck the covenant or made the contract would walk through it together and they would look on each side. And what they are saying is, if I don't keep my side of the contract, then may it happen to me as has happened to the animals. Now, what is the interesting feature about Genesis 15? Who walked through there? Abraham did not. God alone walked through there. We saw, we saw the smoking oven and we saw the flaming torch. And we saw Abraham on the side. God basically said, this is the covenant. This is the promise. But if there's any curses to this, I will care for the curse as well as the promise. And God was caring for his own at that time. Notice again when Isaac was fairly well grown. And all of a sudden, the Lord said, take, I, take Isaac out to a place that I will show you. And it turned out to be a three-day journey took him out there and basically was called upon to offer him up uh, as a sacrifice. I'm always wondering what Isaac was thinking all this time. He was at least thinking a little bit, wasn't he? He says, well, we got the wood, we got the fire, we've got everything except the sacrifice. What's going on here, Dad? And Dad says the Lord will provide. And from that day on, when all of a sudden the Lord told Abraham to turn around and look behind him, and there was a goat that was trapped in the bush, from that day on, that place was known as Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And this is the one thing that basically keeps me going, is that what God commands of me is what God will also provide for me. He has not put me into a position where because of the nature of the demands, I will fail. He has put me into a position that by his grace, he will see to it that the job is done. Now that's supposed to be the conclusion of the matter, so I'm sure that you would be happy to have a closing word of prayer, but that's not gonna happen, at least before 
Roman numeral one and Roman numeral two. And what we see here is basically the believer's responsibility and God's responsibilities. And this gives to us the nature of our relationship with the Lord as well. And we should rejoice and be glad in that. Things, some things here, it seems as though we're capable of doing. We can rejoice, we can pray, we can give thanks, and we can say, oh good, this is God's will for me, and I'm doing it. Except for the little conditioners there, right? Look again. Rejoice always. Is it easy to rejoice always? Maybe in your life, but not mine. Pray without ceasing. Probably this is the one thing that we need to do, but sometimes it's hard to pray, isn't it? And sometimes because it's hard to pray, it's easy to defer it. And we can be thankful, but sometimes we look at our lives and we say, nothing here to be thankful for. And that's untrue. And sometimes it seems as though that it's easy to get mad at God. And therefore, we pay no attention to his word, or even worse yet, we even would despise it. William James made a rather interesting statement. Most of us have been taught that there are things that happen in our lives, and we respond to them emotionally. But William James said, sometimes when we act emotionally first, then the cause will come about. And I don't buy into that too easily, but yet I can see that what is being said here almost leads to that. Rejoice at a time when it is really hard to rejoice. Go through the act and maybe the feeling will come. Pray all the time, even if you don't feel like it. And maybe as you pray, you will feel like it. Don't quench the spirit. Maybe if I go ahead and work it through, I will find that the spirit is working really greatly in my life. Well, let's look at the re believer's responsibility in something perhaps a little bit more than a summary form. I <clears throat> sometimes, it seems like some of the passages of scripture that I memorized uh, that had some length to them uh, don't seem to have that length anymore, but I still have all of this verse down. Rejoice always. I still have a good enough memory to keep this one in place. And it's really very simple that we should have a lifestyle of joy. And I've seen it happen in the lives of people at times when there should not be any joy there. I've seen it in the lives of some of the members of this congregation as, during times as well. But we can rejoice always because the things of lasting value can't be taken away. Notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10, when Paul speaks of his ministry and notice the attitude, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing all things. Sorrowful, but yet he's got the capability and the capacity to rejoice. Poor, and yet he seems to be in possession of some kind of a bank account that he can make other people wealthy. Having nothing, and yet he possesses all things. What are we talking about here? We are talking about the difference between the age in which we live and the age to come. We are called upon to live the future now. We are called upon to live the attributes and the characteristics of the coming of the kingdom now, and we wait for the glory of the coming. When Jesus told his hearers that we should put our treasure in heaven, and that's where we should find it, what we are basically saying that the things of lasting value Paul has. The things that are temporary, he may not have. 
But that's all right for two reasons. They're temporary, they're gonna go anyway. And under these circumstances, even if they stay, he goes. But he does have those things of everlasting value. And the things that would make us happy as Christians. Why are we happy as Christians? Because of what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. Because of what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. Because of what Jesus Christ is doing for us now as he sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you and me. As he stands prepared to keep his promise to come and gather his own to himself and to bring us into the glory of the kingdom. These are things that are lasting. And we are not to put our treasure where rust and, where rust and moth corrupt. We have a treasure put in a place that itself cannot be corrupted and the treasure therefore cannot be corrupted. And so we can rejoice always because of the relationship that we have with the Lord. We rejoice, we are sorrowful, and it seems to me that the suggestion is there, even though we are sorrowful now, yet always we rejoice. The sorrow is temporary, the joy is permanent. Poor, yet we have some kind of wealth that in our poverty we can make others rich. And while we look as though we are poverty stricken, and in some ways we are, we possess everything. And notice again in Philippians chapter 4, what seems to be a suggestion in 1 Thessalonians 5.16 seems to be stipulated in Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. Here is the source for our joy. The source for our joy is our relationship with the Lord. He is the one, as we have said already, who did a work for us on the cross. He didn't have to do a work for himself on the cross. He did it for us. He was the one who knew no sin that was made sin that we might have the righteousness of Christ. And if everything else is taken away from us, this we still have. And notice in Romans eleven twenty nine. 29, while this needs to be looked at a little more closely in terms of context, in my view, this is still something of a standalone verse. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable because we trust in him who grants these gifts to us and he doesn't take them away at a whim. They're irrevocable. And so we always pray. We pray without ceasing. We pray without ceasing because the temporal can indeed be changed Notice in James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another so that you may be healed. And the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. There's much to be debated perhaps in this verse, but the one thing that cannot be debated, debated is the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. There are some things that are fixed in stone by our view. There are other things that are not. We still have to say God's yes is yes and his no is no. And once we see what the answer is, we move on from there thanking him for his faithfulness to us. And that leads us to the next responsibility. We have this, our personal faith, and it requires joy. It requires prayer. It requires thanks, thankfulness. Notice in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Some people argue that this is God, God's will for you in Christ Jesus, is that you're supposed to give thanks all the time, or it's his will that you are in these circumstances. It seems to me that you have to meld the two together that regardless of the circumstance, you're still supposed to give thanks. And so it is that we should be thankful people. And sometimes that's hard, isn't it? Eventually, we might be able to work around it, but it's really great if we could respond that way quickly uh, and regularly. And many a person has been known to do that, and they are a good example 
to all of us, be ever thankful that whether the circumstances are dark and gloomy, whether they are bright and cheerful, we give thanks either way because this is God's will for us and God's will for us is always best. Notice that God's good and perfect intent will be accomplished in our lives. And I went to Romans chapter 8, but I fooled you. I went to verse 37 instead. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. You thought I was going to 828, didn't you? I fooled you. But I did this on purpose. Because notice that this verse speaks of conflict. This verse speaks of some kind of an adversarial relationship. This verse speaks of combat. And that's why I wanted, wanted to do that. Because in all of these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Therefore, we rejoice. Therefore, we are in prayer, either petitioning for the battle to be won or thanking him that the battle has been won. And this is why we are thankful. Because the battle has been won or we know that it will be won. And God's perfect will and intent will be accomplished in our lives. And that's the one thing that keeps us going sometimes, isn't it? To know that God is still working in our lives and his perfect will will in fact be accomplished in our lives. And so it is with one's faith and practice. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise the prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good and abstain from every form of evil. There's a whole lot to be debated and argued in these verses as well. But what I keep in mind is that the word was still in the, the word in meaning the New Testament was still in process of being written. And they did have prophetic utterances. But those prophetic utterances had to conform to the scriptures as they were written in the Old Testament and they had to conform to the gospel as it was being uh, proclaimed by the apostles and the apostolic representatives. Prophecies are not to be despised. Notice that there are more than predictions, and this is the one thing that we need to keep in mind. Today, the term prophecy also means a prediction. So we have somebody who comes on TV, and all of a sudden he has these prophecies from God. And they always seem to be a prediction, and the next thing you know, they're a prediction that <clears throat> the Antichrist is going to come out of this tree or that tree or the woods, uh, or this is what's going to happen to the economy in the next 10 years. I just wish that from the time I was 12 years old, I would have kept a list of all of the prophecies in the name of Jesus that have fallen to the ground. And of course, you know my favorite response to that, according to the book of Deuteronomy, if you made a prophecy and it didn't come true, you didn't have a second chance. You got stoned, end of story. So that kind of kept the false prophets down a little bit, or at least it kept them ready to travel. I understand that in those days, because cash was kind of heavy to carry around, they usually divided it up into thirds. They kept one third on the table that anybody could see. They could break into the house and steal it. They kept another third buried someplace just in case catastrophe came. And they had another third stuck in the camel ready to ride out. And if they could survive uh, off of that one third, then they could come back and dig up the rest of the treasure and start all over again. Now, all of that was supposed to come back here. This is why the false prophet wants to travel easily. The working definition of prophecy, when we look at it, it is primarily God's statement of purpose and intent for his people to either call them to repentance or to call them to stand firm in times of difficulty. And the prophetic element, the predictive element, was secondary. The primary element in the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New, is basically to say this is God's will and this is how you can know that it is his will. And so any kind of prophecy that we can see today on TV or read in the books, if it doesn't take us back to some kind of a moral calling for us as God's people, it's tremendously defective uh, if not uh, totally false. Notice that the faith is to be honored. 
They are not to be despised, but we need to keep in mind that they're more than the predictions. They're declarations of God's will for his people, inspired by his spirit, and to be applied by the people. But notice also that all things are to be tested as well in verse 21. But examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Put it to the test. And this is one of the things that we even notice today. You get somebody's favorite preacher on there and he says this is what's going to happen and because he said it, because we like him, because it feels so good, it's got to be true. There isn't, there isn't any safe standard in that kind of a concept. The safe standard comes, this is what the person says, what does God's word have to say? The Bereans were known to be more noble when they heard the gospel because they went to the scriptures to test it to be true. Now, do you think that they lost that nobility after they confessed Christ as Savior? This is why it's a scary thing to be a part of the evangelical church and to have the sociologists let us know that the Bible is a closed book even in the evangelical family. So let's us at least be sure to follow Brother Ken's advice and next Sunday night for an hour uh, you just read that scripture and you'll get off with the bonus because it's less time than if you were to come to church. Ken probably will never talk to me again. Notice that the faith is to be practiced. This is the one thing that I notice about scripture, particularly prophetic scripture. Name the part of the scriptures where it gives a prophetic statement, but it does not call us back to proper living. And even in this time, when everybody talks about Jesus is going to come and this is why, so get all excited, he's coming soon. The whole idea is if you're getting all excited and he's coming soon, you're a little more diligent in your walk with the Lord. And that's the intent and the purpose of prophecy, to make us much more committed and ready to walk the walk and talk the talk. So with respect to what the prophecy has to say, we ferret out the true from the false. And when we put the false to the side and we see the true, we see what good there is for living. And then after examining everything carefully, the speaker and the message, then when we examine these things and we know what is true, we hold fast to that which is true because there's where we find the goodness of it all. And by the same token, we abstain from every form of evil. Remember that, the, that this command in verse 22 is tied in with examining everything carefully. And sometimes when you read that, you say evil seems to be too strong of a word. I think not. Anything that would direct us away from the will of God is evil. How can we live a life that Christ has called us to live if we do not do his will? For what we see, what, at the close of the Sermon on the Mount, in that day, many will say, Lord, Lord. And what is he going to say? Depart from me, I never knew you. They say, Lord, Lord, let me in. After all, we, we did all of these things. We did the miracles. We did all of these things. And what did he say? You depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Why? Because you did not keep my word. And there is the understanding of evil for you and me. Anything that would turn us away from the known will of God is evil. If that sounds too strong, my apologies, but I will give you permission to go ahead and scratch out that term evil and put in whatever you want, knowing full well that you won't do that. These are our responsibilities. And sometimes the situation is such that the responsibilities are hard to come by. But it's not impossible. Because in basically two verses, what we see is that God has taken on the responsibility to enable us to be responsible. For notice in verses 23 and 24. Now, 
May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. Notice the responsibility that the Lord takes on. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. That what he does, he does as a friend. We keep in mind that the biblical notion of peace has two aspects to it, and we can find that in broader contexts anyway. But the notion of peace scripturally, first of all, means the cessation of hostility between God and man. That when Jesus Christ came and they would sing of the, we would sing of the coming of the Prince of Peace, he has come to reconcile us to God. That that chasm which divides God and man has been bridged by Jesus Christ, who is our propitiation, who is our satisfaction with regard to the demands that the Holy God has made. And so the God of peace and what he provides, he provides in the interest of peace, he provides as the God of peace, and it should contribute to our peace as well, that there is to sanctify you entirely. For this message, we will at least restrict the notion of sanctification to speak of being dedicated to the Lord and being able to serve him acceptably. There's much more to it than that, but for what I can see out of this context, this was what would work well in the narrowed sense. That notice the God of peace himself. Notice that term to sanctify, it's the verb. This is what he does for you, this is what he does for me. And when all of a sudden you and I seem to feel as though we have to go about and live the life of holiness in order to have God pleased, let's keep in mind that it is God who is working in us. And let us keep in mind that this is what God wants for, for his children and from his children, and he's going to aid his children. Speaking of children, when yours were at home, when they were little, when they first started to walk, you stepped back and you let them walk, didn't you? But just about the time you thought they were going to fall, did you step back and say, oh, look at that fall. Get up, little guy. Now you know what life is all about. You didn't do that. If you did, don't tell me about it at the door. This is what we did. And when they started to walk, we encouraged them to do so. We gave them the latitude to do so, but we were in close range to make sure that if they were to stumble and fall, they would not get hurt. And it seems to me that that is at least something of an apt illustration of what we see our Lord doing for us. And to sanctify you entirely, that he does not look just at a certain aspect of our lives, he looks at our lives completely. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved. Oh, let's do it anyway. When we were in Bible college and seminary, remember the great debate? Is a human being tripartite or is he bipartite? Does he have only two portions to him or three? If he has only two, he has the material and the immaterial. He has body and soul. But then along comes the man holding the Bible in his hand and opening it up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and say, looky here, there are three categories. There's body, soul, and spirit. And then the person who is bipartite would say, okay, I can see body as material, I can see soul as immaterial, but what is this spirit thing? And so this is how we spend our time drinking coffee. Now, 40 years later, <clears throat> you just have to guess. But notice that the prayer is, and may your spirit and soul and body those two aspects, be preserved complete. Notice that God is interested in our well-being in totality. And without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In theology, we oftentimes speak 
of our sanctification as being seen complete in the presence of God and being a process going on now. But notice that the completion, notice that when it takes place, it is still a process and may it work until we see Jesus Christ face to face. This is his promise. And that promise covers everything that we looked at. It covers the joy and the rejoicing. It covers the prayer. It covers the thanksgiving. And if we were to go beyond the scope of this text, it covers everything that God requires of us. And the assurance is this. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. Here's where I find my strength. Here's where I find my encouragement. Here's where I find the reason to finally pick up that foot and put another one forward and another one forward when the days are tough. God is faithful, and therefore we should be faithful too. God is competent, and God is committed. He has made the promise, and in, he will keep that promise. For notice, if you will, Philippians 1.6 for I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Hooray, I am a work in progress. No matter what you think, I am a work in progress. It may be going a little more slowly with me than with you, but it is going. And I take heart in that. I am confident that he who began the good work in you will perfect it, meaning to bring it to completion, he will be in that completing process until the day of Christ Jesus when it stands complete. We're commanded to rejoice, to pray, to respect the word and the will of God and to obey the proclamation of God's word. And this isn't always easy to do. But we can do this because we have the promise of God that what he requires from us, he provides for us. And this is what we see in this sixth verse. That he who began the good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. And notice also that as I see it, Philippians 1.6 gives us the big picture. It gives us the vast terrain. Philippians 2.12 and 13 gives us the particulars in day by day. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And if we stop there and close the book, that is a very somber statement. And if we go on to the next verse, it is a somber statement, but it has a load lightener. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. There's, these are the particulars. We are to take responsibility for our lives. We are to take responsibility for our Christian walk. We are to understand that salvation speaks of living a changed life day by day. Salvation is not just a life insurance policy that kicks in when we die or when Jesus comes. It is that which is supposed to be working in our lives here and now. And the whole idea of work out your salvation doesn't mean work to get saved. It means you're saved. Now, if you really are saved, let's see the fruit of the labor. Let's see the fruit of the change that has taken place because of God's grace working in your heart and your life. And it is overwhelming. I enjoy the prayer that you hear the person say, Lord, so far through this day, I've made it very well without a sin. And thank you for that. Now as I get up, help me for the rest of the day. That's my prayer regularly. But this is my encouragement, and I hope it is yours. It is God who is at work in you, both at the point of your will and at the point of the work to do his good pleasure in you. And this is what we want, is it not? Do we not want 
our lives at the end of the day to represent God's good pleasure and to know that I am not alone and to know that where my weaknesses fairly well guarantee failure, that he is working from the point of the will to the point of the deed for the purpose of his good pleasure. And this is why we want to be Christians anyway. Do we not want to live our lives in a manner that pleases the Lord? If not, we should stay home on Sunday night and not read our Bibles and forget about it for the rest of the week. I'm so glad you were here tonight, Ken. As we close out 1 Thessalonians, let's not be afraid of those times when there is no joy. Let's continue to rejoice when it seems that we should not. Because we rejoice in the Lord, not in the circumstance. Let's continue to pray. And we pray to the Lord for his will to be done, regardless of the circumstance. And let's be thankful for what he has accomplished in our lives and for what he is going to accomplish in our lives through the circumstance. And let's always be amenable to the word of God, to the will of God. And let's put one foot in front of the other and see what God is going to do with us and through us. And to me, it's a great statement of grace to know that the day will come when I will hear, well done, you good and faithful servant, because I know full well in my life that I could not be the good and faithful servant without his grace. Our Father, as we come to you in prayer, we rejoice in the grace that is ours in Christ Jesus. We rejoice that you did not give us this great gift and then walk away from us. But your interest in us goes as deep as the cross. Your interest in us is seen clearly at the mouth of the empty tomb. Your interest in us is seen at your right hand. And we thank you for him who has your ear and who makes intercession for us that we might indeed be the people that you want us to be and that in when we are in our right minds, this is what we want to be too. Thank you for this, our time together. Thank you for the joy of fellowship and for the oneness that we have in Christ. May we always rejoice over this. In Christ's name we pray, amen.